you for everybody who has joined on with us. Uh, my name is Judy Schmidt. I'm a 4-H youth development educator for University of Illinois. And my um, coworker, Emily, is also on. She's going to be running the technology side of things for like today. To introduce um, Shannon Egley today. He is our first um, presenter for our Meet a Seam Professional series this month. Um, we have worked with Shannon many times in the past um, for our summer camps, and he's always a favorite um, when we go to jump. So we're so excited that he's able to join us. We aren't able to be there um, face to face this year, but thank you so much for um, letting us see what you do. Shannon's the anatomical coordinator at Jump Simulation Center, and I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Shannon, and thanks again for um, taking time to share your job with us today. Yeah, this will be this is really fun. Um, we've been doing more virtual things lately, whether it's teaching the med students or teaching STEM, so I should be really used to this, but it's still kind of weird staring at myself on the screen talking to people. Um, so my background, uh, right now I work for Jump Simulation Training and Education Center. I also work for OSF St. Francis in the University of Illinois College of Medicine here in Peoria. Uh, we're actually a collaborative effort, Jump is. Jump is all about medical simulation. We try and make training doctors as realistic as possible and with STEM events we try and get kids interested in being doctors. So whether it's coming to visit us and do small STEAM events like dissecting organs or inflating lungs or even doing things like medical visualization. We do engineering camps for medicine where you want to do different physics concepts that are related to medicine. Um, like I said, medical visualization where they can build video games for medical education, which we do here too. Um, but my background, I went to school Actually, it took a while to go to school. I graduated from high school and decided to do a lot of things that I figured I didn't want to do before I went back to, to college. So I went a little bit late. When I got to college, I wanted to be an architect and then I realized there was a lot of math involved in architecture and I wasn't a huge fan. So that steered me in another direction. Um, I, I just kind of wasn't sure what I wanted to do and I took a biology class and really enjoyed it. I loved dissecting cats. That was the first time I'd ever dissected anything ever was and well, I guess it's not true. My family were hunters, so I had to, to clean animals. But um, in school, I never dissected a frog or a worm or anything. So now for a living, I dissect things all the time. Um, when I switched gears, I actually liked the brain and I liked biology. So I thought maybe psychology or some kind of biomedicine would be interesting for me. And of course, both. Um, I took a lot of biology classes because I enjoyed the dissection part of it, I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting learning how things ticked and what made us work and figuring out that what's happening inside of me is happening in all these other organisms out there. So that was pretty cool. And then for psychiatry, I just, I, I liked learning about how people thought. And I thought, well, I could do this. I could sit and listen to people all day. And so I went through my four years of undergrad. I started at a community college and worked my way through, went to a state college and graduated with a, a bachelor's degree with a focus on psychology and specifically neuropsychology. So I started med school to be a psychiatrist and realized pretty quick when we do rotations or you spend time working with the profession you're wanting to go in that maybe psychiatry wasn't for me. I found I didn't want to sit all day and just listen to someone talk about problems, but I was really still fascinated with the brain. So um, I ended up switching gears and going into research and I became a neuroscientist. So I love uh, dissecting, testing, experimenting. Uh, I did my research mostly in pain and trying to help prevent pain and learning about opiates like uh, morphine. And then uh, when I was doing some of my presentations for the med school that I was at, one of my professors said, uh, you translate medical terms really well so that the layperson could understand it. Would you be interested in teaching? And I said, absolutely not. Yeah, no, that was, Definitely not the path for me. I was not meant to be a teacher, I thought. And then uh, a couple months later, a dean from a local college watched one of my research presentations and said the same thing. She said, we have a class that we have available if you'd like to teach it. And I said, that's just not for me. And she said, we'll pay you this much money. And I said, I will be there when you need me. So uh, it's funny how 
your path kind of steers or changes, not necessarily where you want it to go, but in general directions, kind of where you need to go. And I've been teaching and, and working in the labs ever since. So what I do at Jump, and I'll kind of walk through Jump a little bit. We're actually in a virtual operating room right now. And I'll just flip this around. And I'll talk to you, but I'll also show you some things. There we go. So this is our virtual OR, or VOR. Uh, this lab's set up so that's just like the surgery room over in the pediatric uh, area at the Children's Hospital of Illinois here at OSF. And this is an exact replica of it. Anywhere you see mirrors and jump, it's actually a two-way mirror. So there's somebody sitting behind it typically. You see me in the mirror, but uh, there are a bunch of computers back there so that our technicians can run the simulation. And simulation is basically just, we'll put a table, a surgical table in the middle of the room. We can put a mannequin on it that can do a lot of things. The mannequins can, well, they can simulate breathing. They can blink their eyes. They can uh, dilate their pupils or constrict the pupils. So a little black part in your eye can open or close. In fact, we try and keep it as real as possible. So here's the scrub room. The surgeons or whoever's learning, if the technician comes in, they scrub in, just like the real thing. We watch them, we uh, grade the performance. And if you look up in the top corner, you can see cameras. There are over 60 cameras in the first two floors of Jump. So everything that happens here, we record. And then we um, can play it back so that the teacher can improve the learning situation. This is kind of behind the scenes. There's one of our STEM specialists, Chris Lartner. Oh, he's there. STEM people. Oh, hell, STEM people. <laughs> and this is where the technicians run around all day. So, in these rooms, they can sit here and look into a patient room. Their computer would go right here, and everything that happens in this room can be controlled by a computer. So we'll go into it. Make sure around the corner. On a typical, um, because of the whole pandemic, we don't have a lot of people walking through our hall, halls, but you'd see a bunch of med students or nurses that are sitting on this couch flipping through their notes crazy like because they're just about to go into a real life testing simulation. So they would open up the doors here and walk into our virtual hospital. And virtual hospital here is exactly like OSF's hall. So it's to replicate the cardiac center over at OSF. Um, the flooring is actually two different kinds because they wanted to know what was safer and what would last longer. So OSF actually has put two different floors down to see which one wears and tears better. Um, over at OSF, you'd have a station where the nurse or the doctor would sit here and they could look in and check on their patient. There's that same room we saw from the other perspective. So if you're a doctor or a nurse, you'd come along, you'd get your clipboard, your charts. You'd come to your room, you'd make sure your patient was the right one. And then you walk in. And there's a mirror again. We were just on the other side of that mirror. But these rooms, the virtual patient rooms, are exactly like the patient rooms over at OSF. So everything you see on the walls, it's all real. If we need to uh, run pure oxygen, we actually have oxygen up on the walls. All of the equipment's real. So if we needed to shock somebody back, the actual equipment for shocking them, like if somebody's heart stopped and you have to um, defibrillate them, we actually use that real equipment. Uh, it just has a safety switch on it so that we can turn off so it only shocks themselves. You can see all of the cleanup station. There's where the doctor and nurse can sit and observe their patient. Um, if this patient needed an MRI or a CT scan or an X-ray or something, instead of running our mannequin down to get that scan, what they would do is they just pick up a phone right over there. They would call that department. And what happens is it actually rings at that main computer. And that same specialist will act like the, the radiographer and say, what can we do for you? Make sure you get x-ray, okay? And then they pop the x-ray up on that computer like instantly. So when a doctor or nurse comes into the simulation, they treat it as real as possible. This is the mannequin, one of the mannequins. Like I said, some of them, their eyes can blink, your pupils dilate and constrict. Um, they can do lots of things. They can vomit. We can um, give birth through some of them. So give birth to baby mannequins and the and it can actually pushes the baby out. They can hear if the mannequin needs to speak, we can actually speak from that room over there um, to tell the doctor or nurse what's happening. So they run through the whole simulation as if it's exactly real. And that's really important because if you read something in a textbook or 
you don't get the chance to practice it, you're more likely to make mistakes. In this situation, we can make all the mistakes, we can make it feel real, and then when that person's in the real scenario, a doctor or a nurse, they do the right thing at the right time. We also have actors that will lay in these beds, so the actors are amazing. They can play patients with real symptoms, and they can change the pathway for the doctor or nurse so that um, the scenario is always different. When I was a kid, we had choose your own adventure books, and this always reminds me of choose your own adventure because whatever you do in the scenario is super variable. But normally the receptionist or charge nurse, which is the nurse that's in control of things would be sitting there. Oops, I don't want to make anybody dizzy. We'll go across here. We have virtual. I see user intensive care units. Oh, it's very empty. But it's a lot like the last room, whoa, right. Except it has its own mirrored control center because a lot more can happen in this room. We can take a real life scenario that's happening right now across uh, the street at the hospital and we can plug it into this and we can run through the worst case scenario. So what if this happens with the patient? How will we respond? That way when it really does happen, they've already practiced it two or three times that morning. Come on here. Briefly, I keep this brief. So they're walking into an outpatient clinic. So if you went to the emergency care, or if you went to even a doctor's office or a psychiatrist's office, we would have the receptionist here. We could actually have uh, actor patients sitting here waiting to go into their rooms. We can turn this into um, like an OBGYN clinic so that if someone's pregnant and they were um, practicing checkups and stuff, we can turn this room into that. We can turn it into a, an emergency care like an ergo. We can turn it into a dentist's office, a psychiatrist's office, uh, whatever we need to. And what's really fun is that if we have a patient, um, we can anonymize the patient and bring it up on the computer. So a real patient, but their name's not showing up and run through the possible scenarios that could happen with them in this area. And because everything's so real, the last thing that a learner will do is go through something called debriefing, where they go into one of these rooms afterwards. The brief room. Locked, uh -oh. Hmm, they're not usually locked. So in these rooms, as soon as they walk in, you saw their cameras in all of the rooms we passed through. There are even cameras in these rooms. Uh, as soon as they walk in, their video of what they just did pops up on the screen because they were scheduled for this room, kind of like that. And then everybody that was involved, all of the actors, all of the teachers, um, the learners, they all sit around these tables and they go through the video and talk about what, you, what did you do really well? What can you do better? We don't say, oh, you messed this up. Um, you're not doing very well. We don't want to make people feel bad. We just want to point out what they do well and then what we can help them do better. What's really tricky is that, you know, sometimes people die in hospital situations, but they never die here. So in the, even in a simulation event, if someone's getting close to um, making mistakes, like a doctor's making a mistake, because they're, if they make a mistake that could potentially kill somebody, their teacher will step in as, as their attending boss and say, what would you do if this scenario were a little bit different? So we want to make sure that it's a safe psychological environment too, not just safe around them. Right. We'll walk down to the lab staff. Um, Jump's background is actually really cool too. The person that gave us the money to start uh, ATV accident, accident and when she was treated at OSF, he said as soon as she could transfer to learn Chicago, just assume that because you have a big city, a big city hospital, you're getting a better level of care. But what he found afterwards was that the level of care here was better than what he got in a, a big city. So he said, if you can build a facility that can teach people to do what you did, then I will give you a lot of money. Just millions and millions of dollars to build a six-story facility. And a couple of the rooms that I was going to show you are actually booked. We'll go into the labs. So we do a lot of outside houses too. The world's actually come here. 
can't really stop and look, but so they're all masked, keeps it anonymous. But those were some of the uh, medical students that are training. We have some really cool video games. This is my favorite arcade ever because a lot of these tools simulate, oops, we've moved a lot of them out of here, but a lot of these tools simulate what a doctor would do in surgery. And like, for instance, this one in the corner that is out of service right now, we don't want people touching anything. Um, we'll actually do abdominal surgery. So we'll pop two tools in here as if it's the person's belly, kind of like this. So we'll pop a camera in. We can pop these tools like this, a little pair of scissors, we can put them in. If they need a tool for grasping, they can grab a grasper and put it in. So this is the old way we did training. You have this fake belly, they have a camera that goes in, you do the surgery down here and it will pop up on the screen because you can't just look through someone's belly. But the holes are so small, they can put two or three stitches in and it's like it never happened. This one's awesome because it's like a video game. You put the tools in, up here you have a 3D-like image. Every time that you poke or touch something, you can feel that thing inside the machine. So if I poke a liver, it feels like I'm pushing the liver. If I pull on a gallbladder, it feels like it tugs back. Pretty amazing. We can do ultrasounds. So we can put, uh, there's a woman mannequin that we put up here that has third month of pregnancy, and you can actually see the baby moving inside of her, and it's mind-blowing. It's amazing. Hopefully you'll get a chance to come here someday. So from this side, you can see a mirror, but you might not be able to see very well. We have a very large ambulance down in our bay. We can peek in there. And we have a whole apartment built in. How to do extractions, which take the patient out of the situation where they were hurt. We have an ambulance, and inside the ambulance, it also has a camera. We have, whoops, I don't know if you can see them. We mounted cameras in here. So when we do paramedic or EMT training, it's very real and we can record everything so that we can go back and teach them how they can improve. There's no engine in it, so we have to plug it in just to be able to flip the lights and everything on it inside the cabin. We have an apartment building, a single apartment. You can see it looks just like an apartment. Everything works in here so that if we need to train someone to, um, let's say an elderly person falls in the bathroom, it's a real tiny bathroom and it's really hard to get into. So it's the worst case scenario and the hardest place to train. They can practice extraction or taking the person out of that situation. We can move them down around the corner and then practice putting them into the ambulance. Um, we used to have, and I don't know if we're bringing them back, but you can see this device here at the ceiling. It was actually a projector. There's another one over there that would project scenes on the ground. So we could project a road through here and then the paramedic or EMT would have to take their cart and move really close to the, the truck to avoid getting hit by a car. Another mirror. There's the mirror we looked at in just a second ago. But that's a control room up there. And the last two labs are my favorite labs because the two I work in every day. New steam events. We're just peeking in because they're super busy. We've been packing STEM kits uh, because we're doing at home dissections. And then this is the surgical lab. This is actually my home. I'm the anatomical coordinator here, which means I set up the surgeries in this lab. And we work with cadavers. So people that have died and donated their body to science for training, we'll bring them in. We treat the entire situation like it's a real life situation in the operating room. We'll put them on the table. Um, we will make their chest rise and fall just like they're breathing normally. We have blood that runs through their body so that if uh, the surgeon makes a mistake, they bleed just like a normal person. We're actually cleaning the lab and getting ready to reopen. So I have a bunch of inventory along the wall, but every surgical tool that you can imagine, almost every surgical tool we have in here, so that whatever the surgeon wants to do, we can do. 
we have five stations. So you can see the surgical lights up there and it's just exactly like real surgery. And the gas on the walls and everything are realistic. It's a really fun place to be. So now I'll show you. As kids, I said they're, right now we're doing uh, shark dissections. So about two months ago, we decided that we wanted to reach out to people stuck at home that couldn't do much science at home. And we thought, what can we send them? It's really fun. You can't really get in a store very easily uh, that they can dissect and learn a lot about. And we thought, sharks. So not everybody's cut a shark open, but we get dogfish sharks. We take the students through the whole dissection, through every organ system, and we compare how a shark and a human are similar and how they're different. It's kind of fun because uh, we don't really think of sharks and humans being very much alike, but you can see the similarities. Like in the heart, the way the heart works, very similar. A uh, shark's heart only has two chambers, human heart has four. So we talk about why a shark can live with only two chambers instead of four. We talk about the lungs and the respiratory system. Obviously, sharks live underwater, so they can't breathe oxygen like we do, but they still have to breathe oxygen. We talk about that. We open up the chest, we look inside, we look at the heart, we look for lungs, there are no lungs in there, and so we discuss how they get oxygen, and we talk about the gills and fish. Uh, now, the next thing we're doing, and you're actually the first ones to see this, we do our first practice run tomorrow. But let's see if I can flip it around. So we'll send a kit for dissection. I don't know if that was still on there. So students that are local can pick it up, otherwise we mail it to them. And inside the kit, we have, and hopefully everybody's still there. I am using this on my phone so that I was a little bit more mobile. But if there's a question, I think someone can take over my screen and change it. So the dissection kit, we have a pan. Actually, they have a big sheet that they put on their table because I know mom and dad aren't always excited about dissecting a shark on the kitchen table. But it's actually a, a garbage bag, it's a super large garbage bag so that they set everything up on the garbage bag. Here's a surgical table. It's called the Mayo Stand. The light on. It's already light on. The surgical lights are pretty bright. Hopefully they're not too bright. And then we do a Zoom meeting just like we're doing right now with the students so that they can be live and walk through every step of the dissection with me. Open up. Sheet. Be down for just a second. So they have this like four by six foot garbage bag they sit out on their table. We'll take the tray. Put it in the middle of the table. We try and catch what we can, but we started with small sharks because everybody thought, well, it'd be fun to do baby sharks. So it was baby sharks, um, but they weren't big enough to resolve. So I bumped it up to bigger sharks, and now the sharks are actually usually at least 22 inches long. So they overlap this tray. That's why we have the bag in it. We get a dissection manual that we made for them, step by step. We walk through it, and we spend about three hours taking one step at a time, going through each system, dissecting. We get their proper tools, all disposable, so it's all included in the package. Um, they have their tweezers, their pen. I like them to take notes. Dissecting probe. We get a dissection pad, and then pens across the top here to hold things in place. Send them a bookmark. With the link to do some fun STEM things that we do online. We give them gloves. I'm actually going to put the gloves on because I'll be playing with real organs. And normally, if you're doing this event, you'd be 
doing everything at the same time I do. You cover the table when I do. You pull the parts out at the same time that I do. You put your gloves on the same time as me. Gloving up. Walk them right through it. It's all in the manual. We'll talk about what it's like to be a scientist and how to think like that. We we'll talk about the scientific method and what it actually means beyond just being a scientist, but how you apply it to everyday life. We we'll talk about the right tools, we'll talk about the tools that are in the kit. We make sure that mom and dad are close by. So they can do this pretty much on their own if mom and dad are okay with it, but we just want mom and dad to be there at the same time in case they need something because they're gonna be all PPE or personal protective equipment wrapped. So the gloves are on, they have an apron that they put on, kind of like a lobster bib, except it goes all the way down the front of them so that if they splash, their clothes stay clean. They get a set of goggles, so that their eyes are protected. They have scissors, and they have a bag of fish or organs. And then this shows, there's actually a picture of one of the sharks that come with the kit. So they get all the stuff in it. We wanna make sure that they don't have to use things that are in mom and dad's kitchen, that everything comes with it so that when they're done, they can just take the bag, wrap it over the entire shark, tie it in a knot and throw it in the trash and they're done. Uh, I've had a lot, I usually spend more than the allotted amount of time and I have a lot of kids that stick around and do it for longer and I give them tips of things they can do when we're not online anymore too. So we talk about the difference between autopsy and necropsy. We talk about the shark. We talk about anatomical directions and terminology and how important those things are when you're practicing medicine. So again, the main purpose for me with all of this is actually to get um, kids excited about going into medicine. When I was really young, I loved biology. I just didn't think of it as something I, I would do for those, those places. So we talk about each of the systems. So we talk about shark skin and how interesting the shark skin is because it's actually like a chain, chain mail um, that you would see uh, knights, medieval knights wearing so that when they get stabbed, they're more protected or when they get hit with the sword, they're more protected. But a shark's skin is actually like that. It's a series of teeth. It's not skin like we have, but it's overlapping teeth. Show that and we touch it and we can feel it. Rubbing our fingers in different directions to see the texture. We talk about why the top of a shark is typically gray in color and the belly is more pale or white. We talk about movement and then we start dissecting in. So we'll look at the skeleton of a shark, which is actually cartilage and not bone. We talk about human skeletons and we compare. And kind of the goal is to compare uh, everything. We call it comparative anatomy. So what's a shark's bone structure, quote unquote, like? It's all cartilage, like when you wiggle your nose, that's cartilage in there giving structure. Pull on your ear, it's cartilage. And then we talk about how bone's different. Like even the skull of a shark is cartilage, but when the, the students cut into it, it feels really hard. It was kind of cool, it's kind of clear too, so they can see the brain through the skull, almost like it's uh, not real. And then we compare things like the sensations. We talk about two sensations that sharks have that we don't have as humans, why it's a benefit to them. We talk about reproduction in the structure arc, which is really interesting, because they're more like a, when it comes to reproduction, they're actually more like a bird, like a chicken, than they are being like this. We compare them to other types of fish, we talk about how they breathe, and I mentioned that, and we cut into the chest, and we look at the heart, we look at the gills. We explain how the gills pull oxygen out of the water, Here's some actual dissection photos. What's really cool is that I don't have to put a lot of photos of the dissection in here because they're doing it right there at home. We talk about the heart, and the shape of the heart for a human, shape of the heart for a shark, how ours have four chambers, theirs have two. We dissect down into the belly. We explain the digestive tract, starting with the teeth, how many rows of teeth, numbers of teeth, they inspect it, they open up the shark's mouth and look inside. We follow the GI tract all the way down, look in the stomach and see what their last meal was. We get a chance to label the things that we talked about. And then we go to the nervous system again, and then we uh, cut open. We look at an eyeball, the structure of the eyeball, the muscles that control the eyeball. We cut into the brain. 
and they can look at the brain and how the brain of a shark is different from the brain of a human. This is actually the shark's skull. We have a really good medical visualization person that's great with drawing things for us. So any drawing we want, we just subscribe to him and he gets it. It's pretty exciting. And then we have reports. So if you know people that are in the group with you after you're all done, you can compare. How big was your heart? How was how big were how big was your fish overall? What's the wingspan of the fins? It's a lot of really fun stuff. And then they can label the diagram at the end. Pretty much like this. And now we're going to switch it to organs. Like I said, tomorrow is actually our practice run. So normally I have my own Zoom set up and the camera's all hooked into my own account. We're gonna wing this one. We spend about five or 10 minutes talking about safety at the beginning of every session. Anything that's sharp, it doesn't matter if it's a pair of scissors or it's just a pen. Picky about where the sharps are. Here's a sharp a probe. I like to keep it in the top, stuck into the pad where it's nice and safe. Same with our pens down here. Keep it stuck in the pad. And cut this open and check out some of the organs. So the sets come with preserved organs. They're preserved in formalin and other chemicals. Formalin, they used to use formaldehyde, really stinky. Formalin's not as bad as formaldehyde is, but it still is the best smell out there. So we recommend people doing it in the garage or outside, but hide kids do it in their kitchen. Plus it's easier to clean up if you're outside. Hopefully you can see that, but here's a sheep brain. I have a stool. Always improvising. Ah, way better. So the sheep brain has this layer on the surface called dura. And one of the things we'll talk about is that every organ has its own wrapper. It's kind of cool the way the body's designed like that, that every organ has its own wrapper protective covering. It's really separated from other organs, but it's connected to all of them at the same time. Uh, I always think of chicken. When I was a kid, I, I would eat chicken legs and I would peel one muscle group off at a time and I had no idea it was muscle groups, but they were all wrapped in their own wrapper and you could just grab a piece and break it off. It did just fall apart. It, broke into separate compartments. The brain's like that too. It has its own protective wrapper that goes around it. Um, if this wrapper gets inflamed, they call it an itis. And so anytime you hear itis in medicine, it means the inflammation or swelling of something. So this is the meninges. And you take a guess at what they would call the swelling of the meninges. They call it meningitis. So meningitis, this protective covering, it's inflamed and actually smashes on the brain. These brains are preserved, so they're kind of like firm, great for dissection. A real brain, if I held it, I have to be really super delicate. It's almost like warm cream cheese. So if I flipped a, a fresh brain over my fingers and I talked to you for a few minutes and I flipped it back, you would see all of the lines where my fingers are pushing on it. And we're just the way the brain were, were pressing. The brain's super delicate. So when we do brain surgeries in the lab, it's amazing because, um, when you take the skull off and you touch how soft it is, and you can see all the little blood vessels on the surface. Let's do a little cut on this. I'll show you how the sac is protected. So if you imagine this brain, our brain's shaped a lot like this. It's very similar. Uh, a shark's brain is actually a lot more different than a human brain. It has the same parts. The shape's just a lot different. The sheep brain is interesting because if you look at the, the top part, what we call the cerebrum, the main part you think of it with a brain, you got a little bump back here at the back, up here. A little mini brain back here, it's called the cerebellum. Once I cut this, you'll be able to see it. You can cut in. You feel just a little bit. I can feel very easily. There we go. Now you can see, even this wrapper that goes around the whole brain, dips down in and separates the cerebrum, the top part of the brain, the part you do most of your thinking with, from the cerebellum, which is for movement. So when you walk and jump and ride a bike, it's actually this area back here that's helping keeping you balanced and from falling over. This part up here is for all your other thinking, your conscious thinking. So 
when I think of the conscious mind, I think of the things that I'm completely aware of. Your subconscious mind is things that you're not aware of, that you just do instinctively. The cerebellum back here is primarily for the things you do instinctively, like walk. You know, you don't think about, well, where am I going to put my next step? You just walk and all your muscles coordinate for that. But if I'm doing a math problem, it's up in here that actually happens. So if I were looking straight on at the brain, here's where one eye would be connected. There's another eye. You'd be able to see the nerve right here. So this is the nerve that sends all the signals from the eye into the brain. Where that goes, and this is kind of the craziest part, that pathway, when you see something with the front of your eye, the signal goes to the back of the eye. It goes, well, there's actually an eye in here. We can show you the eye at the same time. Whoop, there it is. So the signal goes from the front of the eye, the light passes through, and we would dissect this apart. It would get to the back where you have special receptors for light. It's kind of like a camera, it takes the picture. Um, you don't really know what the picture is until that signal comes out through the optic nerve that we just pointed at right there. The optic nerve goes into the center of the brain into an area called the thalamus. Which if we dissect it down, we'd look at the thalamus. It's shaped like a silly putty container. It goes into the thalamus, and the thalamus says, well, is this image or this picture important to us? If it's not, it stops right there. If it's very important, the image goes right to the back of the brain. So when you see something, light enters the front, goes into the eye, goes to an area called the retina, which is the camera, goes through an optic nerve, goes to the center of the brain, there's a decision maker that says is it important or not, and then after that, it goes all the way to the back of the brain, right here in front of the cerebellum, so back in the cerebrum called the occipital lobe. This is where you see vision. So I just think that's crazy that you see it from the front of your eye, but you actually in your brain see it with the back of the brain. Let's go ahead and cut this. If you have a brain like this, you have a left and a right side. The patient's left is right here. The patient's right is over here. When you describe anything, it's always the patient's perspective. So if I were looking at the patient like this and they were looking back at me, it's still left is here, even though this is my right hand, right is over here. So I will cut just that the meninges. There's a lot of sound effects when I do stuff like this. Too. Cutting right along. And just like there was a divider that separated the cerebellum from the cerebrum, there's a divider that separates the left brain from the right brain. So as I cut this, the right brain stays in its package. And I can open up the left brain. And now, I can actually see all the blood vessels with the dark things across the surface. I can see the gyri, which are all the bumps. These bumps here. And I can see sulci, which are the grooves. And usually the blood vessels sit in the grooves. So this protective layer here, the outer one's very durable, so we call it the dura matter. If you look under a microscope, there's a real thin web like, like a spider web underneath. That's called arachnoid actually like a spider and then pia is the precious one and i don't know if you can tell from this image but if i squeeze it a little bit it almost looks like there's still saran wrap or like a clear plastic wrap on the surface of the brain that's the last layer of the meninges and then in the class we would cut down the middle we'd look at the left and the right we talk about how the left side of your brain is for one function the right's for another left is like the analytical so i always call it the school brain all the things you want in school like reading, writing, arithmetic, all those skills, your organization skills. The right side is more creative, so that when you draw, it doesn't know words, it knows images. Like if I draw a picture and it brings an emotion, it's the right side of my brain. If I draw an image that I'm trying to, to tell something to somebody, it's typically the left side that's doing it. So if I write words, it's the left. If I draw pictures, it's the right. But that's a whole lot of other stuff. So we talk about things like the brain stem, the spinal cord, down here. We talk about bone. So here's a cross section of a leg bone. This is actually a cow, not a sheep, because the bone is too small on sheep. But we would talk about the center that's kind of squishy, called the marrow. We talk about the dense bone on the outside. And we talk about the layer of bone that helps touch the squishy part and connect it with the hard, dense bone. 
We talk about the structures on the outside of the bone. We talk about how bone is actually wrap around the spinal cord and how it works. We will talk about the eyeball, let the eyeball open. And the books, I would show you a book. It looks just like the other one, but it's still in the printer. I don't get them until tomorrow. I'm really eager to show it off. And then we would talk about heart and lungs. This just seems like a big pile of mess here. But if we open it up, let's see, here's the airway. So air would come down, work in here. I'm hoping some of them will have the vocal cords on them, but this is the windpipe. So we would explore, follow down, you'd feel it. It's the way it feels in your own throat. So if you were to touch your neck in that round tube at the front, it feels like this. I can feel little rings, almost like a rib cage or something that holds this tube open so that I can breathe all the time and it's protected. Follow that all the way down and open up the lungs. Oops. This one's kind of smushed a little bit. Band is gone. When we do this at jump, as soon as the whole pandemic issue is over and we have stem learners come back to jump, we do these with fresh organs. So we would actually intubate or put a tube in the airway. We push air in just like you would have happen in the emergency room and we wash the lungs with hand. These are preserved, so they're a little bit more stiff, but you still feel the sponginess. It's pretty cool. We can look and we can see where different lobes are at. So we have here, it's going to be the right lung of the patient, you see the divider down the middle, and the left lung of the patient. Oops, spread these apart. We cut down the tube, we look in the lungs, we cut the lungs apart and we'd actually follow the pathways in class. And then we look at this thing between the lungs, and that would be the heart. And remember how I told you that every organ has a wrapper? The lungs actually have a wrapper, but it's been removed. You've only seen one side of it. It's the protective covering here. But the heart still has its protective covering. It doesn't look much like a heart because you have all this fat hanging off all over the place. But this will probably be the last thing I dissect. There's a kidney in there too. You take this layer, look around a little bit, you can see it's kind of clear here, a lot of fat here. Your heart's the same way. You have this bag that goes around it that protects the heart, and it actually has fat in it. It doesn't mean you're going to have a heart attack. It just means you have this protective fatty layer. Cut into this. Peel the bag back a little bit. I'll just cut again. Snip. There we go. I don't know if you can see, but now I'm definitely inside the bag. Snip, snip. Cut down. And normally, we would separate this. We find out where the top of the heart is, which is up here. This tube would be cut in. And actually, I'll just snip. I'm hoping I can get away with it. So, the sac that goes around the heart that protects the heart is actually called the pericardial sac or pericardia. Peri mean perimeter or around. So, if you have a fence that goes around the perimeter, it's just the surrounding of your house. So peri means around, cardio means heart, so it literally tells you. I even have med students, so I didn't mention this earlier, but I also teach anatomy over at the medical school here in Peoria, University of Illinois College of Medicine in Peoria. And the med students are like, oh my gosh, there's so many new words to learn in anatomy and physiology. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it. And most of them are words you're familiar with. You just have to take the pieces and rearrange them. We talked about that too. I even have a little chart for this section that shows how you can take pieces of words and put them together. So there was the protective covering. Go it back and there's the heart. So this sac goes all the way around the heart. There's fluid in here, so when the heart's beating, it's constantly moving. There's a little water layer, like a water balloon in that. It protects the heart, so it's not rubbing anything. It's actually hovering in a little sac of water. Pretty cool. So I can peel this back. the whole surface of the heart. You see the little tiny blood vessels that go across the surface. You see the little lines that look like rivers or something, how they come down and then they start splitting off. 
those we call the coronary arteries because they're on the surface of the heart. They are what keep the heart alive. So when someone has a heart attack, it's not what's inside the heart that's a problem. It's actually what's happening to little tiny blood vessels that's the problem. Peel back. And the students who actually cut into this, but we can look on the outside and we can see some of the structures. Like how I said, there were four chambers to the heart up here, this kind of dark colored area. This thing's called, called an oracle, and it sits on top of the top two chambers. So there are two oracles. There's actually one on the other side, and there's one here. And the oracles sit on the atria. The atria receive blood from the body or the lungs coming into the heart. Then it comes down below. This big solid mass is actually two ventricles stuck together. So ventricles are the bottom chamber, and they pull blood in, and then they push it back out. So every time you have a heartbeat, you suck blood in into the atria at the top, and then the atria will allow it to suck down into the ventricle. And then when your heart beats and squeezes firmly, it's like you sitting in the bathtub, squishing water in your hand. As you squish this water, your ventricle squeezes like a fist and squirts the blood up, across, and out. And you should be able to see some of those blood vessels. The cardio may not allow us to. So you can't really identify it without cutting, but there's a big tube right here. When the ventricle down here squeezes, it pushes it up, out that tube, and it actually circulates the whole body. Creating pressure. Like I'm kind of running out of time, so I can't talk much more about it, but that's yeah, a lot of fun. Um, and I, I, I get into really cutting into stuff and talking about it, and I'm super geeky. My favorite thing to do, I'm gonna take my gloves off, you. Oh, actually, before I do that, there's a kidney. You would slice the kidney in half, and they would look at what's inside the kidney, and they would look at the different blood vessels coming out. Another glove. Off. Back to me. So, um, I love little facts, fun facts. I think that was kind of the thing that kept me interested in, in the brain is that the brain's so full of facts. My background, um, you heard I was going to school to be a psychiatrist, I ended up becoming a neuroscientist. And I love studying the brain, the spinal cord, and all the structures that come out of it. Um, and there's just so many fun facts, and there's so much we need to know still about the brain and the spinal cord that we just don't understand. So I like to have actually moments. So when someone's telling something about the body or some interesting thing they heard about science, if I know something that can Expand what they know, or if I know something that uh, can help the conversation, I like to say, actually, yeah, I really actually stick my finger up, and actually, and I tell them this little fun fact because um, I love those things. I'm just a trivia geek when it comes to the body. So my goal is to tell you little fun things or to tell my students little fun things that really stick in your brain. Uh, you can go off and tell someone else, like maybe the chicken, green chicken at dinner tonight, and you start separating the muscles. Uh, you can say, hey, actually, did you know that these are individual compartments of muscles? So each one of these little groups that I peel off is a group of muscles. And then maybe you can look it up and identify it. And say, oh, hey, look, mom, this is a sartorius, or whatever the muscle name is. So that's kind of what we do here. Uh, a lot of fun STEM stuff. We try and keep it interesting. I mean, keep trying to come up with new things that, that students will love to learn. I'm not sure what else to say. It. Are you okay if we open it up for some questions now for you, Shannon? Oh yeah, absolutely. I don't think I can read them. Uh, I'm on my phone. Well, and I can't see the chat room. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We'll just see if anybody um, has any questions. But I want to just say thanks first of all. So I've been on a lot of Zoom calls during this pandemic, but this is probably the most exciting one I've been on, um, getting to watch a dissection. So hopefully, um, everybody enjoyed it. Um, Anybody have questions for Shannon? Um, now's your time to ask either about things that he showed you and maybe you had questions about or about what he does for his job. You can type them in the chat and we'll ask them or you can unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask too. Shannon, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about if I wanted to be a doctor, what do I do after high school? Like what are the stages of education and how long do they take and what is that process like? So I'm not an MD. Um, I teach them every day, the MDs, 
But to be a neuroscientist, it depends on what you want to do. So if you want to deal directly with patients, then you have to be an MD. And you can be a neurologist or you can be a neurosurgeon. Um, I looked at those routes and I thought, with a neurosurgeon, just as an example, you have to go through all of your regular schooling. Up through high school, you get your diploma and then you go off to college and you can choose any, any kind of specialty you want. You could do basket weaving for four years as long as you got the prerequisites or the classes that help you become a doctor later. Um, in fact, a lot of med schools prefer having people that have different backgrounds. So uh, I've worked, wow, I've had students that have had engineering backgrounds. I've had some that were in fashion design and they're doctors now. So this neurosurgeon would go through all of high school, go through four years of college, uh, we call it undergraduate, uh, be whatever they want. My four years were focused on psychology. So uh, after that, and I found out psychology actually didn't make me take all the classes to be a doctor, so I had to take all those classes over my summers to go to med school. And then if they want to be a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, then they go to med school. If you just want to do research, you can get a master's or a PhD, which is not working with people directly. It's looking at how the structures work. So you spend most of your time in a lab poking, prodding, cutting, exploring, asking questions, um, doing experiments to, to prove that. If you want to be a neurosurgeon like I was getting at, um, after your four years of undergrad, then you go to med school for four years. And during that four years, the first two are just like um, – high school or college over again, where you're learning all the basics for whatever skill you want to do. So they have to learn about anatomy and physiology at the human level. They have to learn about um, drugs, so pharmacology and how they affect the body. They learn about biochemistry, so all the chemicals of the body and how they work. So for those two years, they're really intense learning about all the basic sciences of being a doctor. That's the first years of med school. The second two years are mostly clinical time. So they're working with patients um, kind of as a shadow for the surgeon. So they'll work with a neurosurgeon. And if you want to be a neurosurgeon, you don't just rotate with neurosurgery. You rotate with cardiology. Maybe I don't want to be a psychiatrist. So these neurosurgeons will spend the two years of basic medical sciences and then two years rotating through all the specialties. And at the end of that, they take tests based on neurosurgery um, to try and get into what they call a residency. So after the four years, they graduate as a doctor, but they're not actually doing anything until they get accepted into a job as a resident. So if you go to a hospital and you're talking to residents, residents are the new doctors that don't have a lot of experience yet. They've had experience with places like Jump, where they've learned to do surgeries with different skills, but they haven't had a lot of patient-patient experience. So a neurosurgeon, this is where it gets really sticky, and I love talking about that, because I have neurosurgeons coming in my lab all the time, but they did their four years of undergrad, their four years of medical school, now they're a resident, and they have seven years of being a resident. So as a new doctor, they spend seven years as a new doctor before they're actually like a full-fledged neurosurgeon. At any time during that time, um, if they're not doing what they're expected to do, then they go back to start and they'll have to find another profession. So it's a really hard road. Some residencies, um, I think psychiatry now is two years, so it's not that long. Uh, to be a family practitioner, I believe it's two years. To be a surgeon, you spend four years as a resident. So it just depends on the specialty. But that's kind of the road to be a doctor. Well, a medical doctor. So how many years is all together? I guess I haven't done the math before. Four years of undergrad. Four years of medical school, so we have eight and seven years, 15 years before you're a full-blown neurosurgeon. Whew. You gotta love it. Sorry, did I answer the question or too much information? I think that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So we have one other question. Um, what skills do you think are most important for um, somebody in your um, job to have? imagination. So um, I don't think I've ever said that before. It's funny that that's the first thing that popped in my mind, but when I was talking about the scientific method earlier, it all comes back to just being open-minded and imaginative, asking yourself weird questions. And I, I tell all my new learners this too. 
when you were two, you're like the best scientist ever because you were exploring the world. You knew how to use your hands and your, your mind and everything. And you just wanted to know everything. And you're asking why, why, why? And terrible too is not because you're so much terrible, but maybe you're just annoying to your parents because you're asking why, why, why? And I'm a parent too, and I find myself doing this sometimes. And uh, Unfortunately, there's a point where parents might say, because I said so. And then you hear more because I said so. And then when you go to school and you learn things from a teacher, the teacher's handling 25 kids at one time. If you're asking these out there questions, sometimes they'll say, because I said so. It's just imagination. If you, if you want to do research, you just have to come up with all the why questions. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And then you have to find your own answer. And if someone has an answer to that question, you have to be a, imaginative and creative and find a way to get the answer yourself. So, yeah, I guess the road to research is just being imaginative, always wanting to know a little bit more and running well with your imagination and creativity. Great, thank you. So um, it's almost two o'clock. Do any of the students have any last questions for Shannon? We appreciate all the time you took to show us um, all the um, labs and facilities at Jump. Um, but any last questions? You can watch too. Right there. <laughs> oh, hopefully we get a chance to see people here soon. Uh, STEM students. Yeah, yeah. You're. Um, Facility is always one of the ones that's very memorable for the students when they do um, the STEM camps that we host there. And um, yeah, it was great that you got to see um, all the parts. You showed them, I think, almost all of the spaces they would have seen if they had been on um, our camp. So um, thank you for doing that. And thank you for the um, dissection. It was great. So Gabriel um, sent a note in the chat. He said, thank you. That was amazing. Awesome. Okay, well, you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat, and we um, thank you as well. Thank you. See you soon. Mm -hmm.